Welcome to the Emissary Authors Podcast. My name is Paul Edwards, and this is my co-host, Jason Todd. And we are here with another fantastic guest who's going to uh, give us a picture of what it looks like to be a faith-driven author who tells a story that matters. So, Jason, great to have you on the show. I'm excited about this episode. How are you feeling? I'm uh, looking forward to it as well. I particularly like the, uh, the tack that... I don't want to give away what he's going to talk about. But I particularly like the tack that he's going to take on... Uh, finding your, finding perhaps what you're meant to do, finding your purpose and uh, exposing yourself to maybe new opportunities in light of your faith and how that works out in your work and your life. Let's, uh, let's bring Travis on here. Travis, welcome. Thank you. Great to be with you. Our guest today is Dr. Travis Goosey, and uh, he is the author of the book Called to Be. Uh, which just came out recently at the time of recording. And um, it's a, a, a project produced a, a little bit in partnership with Emissary, but it's been a long time coming. I've uh, been had, had the good fortune of being intimately acquainted with watching this come from fruition to completion. So, Travis, great to have you on the show. And uh, I want to kick things off with the same thing we ask all of our authors, which is, you know, why this book and why now? Yeah, uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, great to connect with uh, all your audience. Uh, for me, the book really came out of a personal journey, uh, trying to discover who was I called to be. Uh, I had uh, been in ministry for a number of years, had gone to seminary, uh, had my first call as a pastor, thought everything was good, and uh, some difficulties came up, some hurt and pain, and I had to step away from full-time ministry for a little while. And that was probably one of the darkest, most depressing moments of my life. Anytime somebody loses a job, they're transitioning in life, and you're trying to ask the question, who am I? Why am I here? What's my purpose? And so it was about a year and a half struggle. I kind of call it a crucible moment where God just melted me down in order to reshape. Uh, it, it probably is not anything any of us seeks, any of us wants. And yet, though, sometimes you can't run away from those things in life. And it was there that I discovered what my true identity really was. Mm -hmm. It wasn't being in a pastor. It wasn't uh, appeasing people in a congregation or the applause and, hey, great, great sermon, pastor, that I got from others that I had put so much of my sense of identity in. Uh, but it was in Christ alone. And mm -hmm truly understanding that. And then at the same time, I also kind of came across a new uh, assessment tool at the time. It's called Strengths Finder from Gallup. Now it's called Clifton Strengths for anybody who has taken that. And through that assessment, I came to discern things that I always knew about myself. I just didn't have the words and articulation to be able to communicate it to others. And it, and it really was very affirming why I always felt like I was a, a square peg trying to be put in the round hole of pastoral ministry. Uh, and it gave me really not only a sense of who has God created me to be, but how he's gifted me and gave me a sense of permission to live that out and not be somebody I'm not, but to be who God had created and redeemed me to be. And so it was kind of in that process of those things that the vision for Called to Be was born. I discovered coaching, really a personal and practical way to help people discern their calling. Who are they in Christ? How have they been gifted? and what it looks like to live that out in love and service to others. And so it has been a long journey, um, a lot of years of coach training, coaching, uh, did a doctorate in coaching. And part of my uh, doctorate was creating my dissertation, which was really looking at uh, Martin Luther's teaching on vocation, that we all have a calling in life. The field of coaching, kind of melding those two things together, like peanut butter and chocolate, hey, two great tastes that go together. and um, I've just been kind of on this journey of uh, writing called to be ever since. Mm. So I want to pause for briefly on this idea of the crucible moment, because it, it, in my experience, people deal with these crucible moments in one of a handful of ways. One is sort of this all out rejection. Like if we could figure out a better way, so we don't have to experience those moments, yep. you know, like we've done something wrong. If we find ourselves in this, you know, in that crucible. And then there's the, perhaps the other extreme which is everybody's got to go through this crucible moment to be able to, you know, shed the past or, you know, come up with what your purpose is. How do you deal with that crucible moment in called to be? Yeah. So 
really, I think it, it, it all comes down to, I, I firmly believe there's, there's a moment that God saves us and there's a moment God remakes us. Sometimes those can be one in the same moments. Uh, sometimes they can be different points in life. And it's kind of um, uh, part of my training and coaching. I worked with the Patterson Center in doing life planning. And we kind of talk about chapters of life and there are these life gates. And, and there, there's usually only a couple in life, but, but it's basically when you go through that gate from one chapter to another, um, it's not just that you're doing something different, but you are different. And I think that's what that crucible moment is all about. It's that moment where things get stripped away from you. What has worked isn't working. Who you sensed you were isn't who you are anymore. And it's that moment that God just remakes you, he melts you down and, and prepares you for that next chapter. Renewed, uh, a sense of your identity, a sense of your gifting and a sense of your calling. Yeah, because there's so much, there's so many layers to the course of a human life, aren't there? There was like, there was the dream I had that I still have, but it's in a different form now. Yeah. So when I was in my late twenties, uh, I finished time in the military and I went to college and I, uh, had the opportunity to intern and get around professional broadcasting. And everybody's like, oh, you got this golden voice and you belong on the radio and, and all that sort of stuff. And I'm like, well, shoot, I mean, I got, I practically got a, a free walk in to these major stations and one of them offered me a job and all of that. And I thought this could hardly be easier. All I got to do is walk into it. But then I discovered there was a, there was two hours of commuting either way to get to that. Right. And it wasn't, there wasn't much pay in it. And uh, radio continued to decline as an industry to the point that now I would, I would have, I wouldn't have survived. Yeah. And yet the, um, and I, I was bitter about that. Mm -hmm. But now, right, I get to be, you know, I, I like to use the expression. I, I used it when I appeared on your show recently, Travis, even God uses ghostwriters. Yes. Yeah. And I get to help people tell these incredible stories. Um, it, it, and so the, the dream is being fulfilled. It's just, it's just such a departure from what I pictured it to be when I was 29 years old. And so the melting down. It's almost like I don't look at it as, as, as a scolding or a beating because you're, you're, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a form of showing you, you own, you have no idea how deep this is going to go, but to be able to, to roll with it when, you, when it finally comes to you, some of this other stuff has got to go or else you're going to be totally immature and you're not going to handle it well. Yeah. 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 It's, um, it, it's, it's just understanding. I, I truly believe we've been made on purpose for a purpose. And sometimes we, we get sailing out this way. Like when I was younger, I, I was a good runner. And I thought I was going to glorify God by being an incredible runner. And yet, though, you know, in hindsight, it was really about me. It wasn't so much about God. Uh, and, yeah. you know, God kind of had to free me from that self-focused dream. Uh, and, and I think it's just sometimes these moments in which we're, we're moving out. He allows us to go out that way. And it's like, that's fine. But there's a point in which that's not exactly what I had in mind for you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to reorient you. I'm going to reshape you. I'm going to remake you. And, and it's in those moments. What I love, Luther talks about this idea that in all of our callings, there's a cr cross of our vocation mm -hmm. that brings us to an end of ourself and we have nowhere else to go but to Jesus. Yep. And it's in that moment that then, I, I love how he talks about it, he meets us with fresh expressions of the Spirit's moving and new mm -hmm. beginnings and new inspirations. And I think that that's kind of a moment that many of us, uh, whether it's in our marriages, it's in our work, it's in ministry as I had, uh, I think we all go through it at one point or another. For sure. There's like a, I don't want to, exp I don't want to compare it to, um, uh, again, I don't want to invoke the idea of a punishment or, no. uh, you know, condemnation. But there is something of kind of like training to be a boxer. To train to be a boxer, you got to take some beatings. Yeah. And yeah. they're good beatings. They're the kind that prepare you to move faster and think quicker and breathe better and, you know, and land the punch when it counts. Yeah. And that's the analogy I would use for people pursuing their calling. But um, 
you know, to go back to your, to your story, this is something I really valued that you chose to, to put in there, which was that, um, another thing that, uh, that a lot of people get tripped up on is that, uh, they make it too much about the money, mm-hmm. meaning some of the examples you provided in, in the book were people who were financially very successful, but they were unfulfilled. It wasn't scratching the itch. They were like, I'm making a lot of money, but I don't really care for what I'm doing. And, um, then you had the opportunity, uh, from your own experience to come alongside them and say, yeah, you're, you're, you're misaligned. You're out of, you're, you're going off in this direction and it's not what you're made to do. And so then you walk them through this process of discovering what they were made to do and presto voila, right? They, they find, they find a, a, a niche that where they just have this limitless reserve of energy and enthusiasm for yeah. it. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. I want to hear the stories again. I've, I've forgotten the, the names and the faces kind of thing. Yeah. Um, well, if I were to really kind of talk about the, maybe the first one. So I'm starting my journey in coaching and it was in this moment that God also was doing this whole crucible thing with me that, um, I came along a, a, a former member of the, my church and he was just kind of wandering in Hollywood. Um, he was a producer. He was doing like Snoop Dogg videos, not finding a lot of redemptive value in that. And he said, you know, I, I sense God's got me here, but I need to kind of figure out what it would look like to live God pleasing. Cause he, he just was right there on the edge with his faith. I mean, he was getting sure, offers sure. to produce porno videos and it's like, Hey, nobody has to put, know your name, you can make a lot of money. And he's like, no, nah, I don't think that's God pleasing. And so we spent some time uh, doing coaching and really kind of the early formation of my call to be process. Who are you in Christ? What's your ultimate identity? Uh, your unique identity, who's God created you to be of his workmanship, gifting, and design. So really understanding his God-given talents and his wiring. Uh, And then looking around his context and saying, okay, what does it look like to live out who you are, who you've been created and redeemed to be in love and service to others? For you, it's in Hollywood. So where are the opportunities to love and serve? And he even had a a total reorientation of his life because Hollywood works on this whole, what can you do for me? And so it's very contractual, uh, really using people. And he just kind of went into Hollywood with a different perspective. What can I do for you? How can I? And it just, people are like, who in the world are you? But it opened a lot of doors. It gave him a lot of currency um, because he was operating in a way that just didn't normally happen. And so it's examples like that of, of, hey, who am I in Christ? How have I been gifted? And now looking at your context, the it's, it's sometimes your calling is is dreaming about something new, but sometimes it's just more intentionality of where mm-hmm. am I, and now how can I make a better better impact with who God's created and gifted me to be? How can I be a greater blessing and love and serve those within my sphere of influence? And uh, so that's kind of the joy that I get to do uh, in coaching of coming along people and helping them discern that. So let's give some perhaps some clarification in, in the, in your book called to be, when you're looking at what a person's purpose is or what they should be doing, perhaps for a vocation, uh, what I'm hearing uh, is that there is a vocation that works for you. And then there are vocations that don't work for you. There's that I'm hearing that, but I'm also hearing the God has a specific vocation for you. And so if you're not, if the current vocation isn't working for you, it's because you've missed this specific vocation. Yeah. Um, where do you, how do you, how do you deal with those thoughts in your book? What framework are you working from? Yeah. So instead of an outside in, I think that's how a lot of people operate. I, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm doing something, I'm achieving, I'm creating, or I'm missing the mark, you know, yeah. I'm failing miserably. And those things define who I am. Instead, we work with an inside out. Who are you in Christ? How have you been gifted? That's your calling, first and foremost. Who you are as a child of God, priesthood of all believers, and then how you've been uniquely gifted. And then it's living out that calling in love and service for others. So it's a really a total uh, different orientation. It's not an outside in, it's an inside out process that we go through. So uh, we want to help you, first of all, your, your ultimate calling is who you are as a child of God. That nothing in the world can take away. 
uh, no, no failure, no achievement, that is secure. And it's out of that security that then we start living our gifting and how can I be a greater blessing? And then it's just looking around and it's not always asking the question, what does the world? It's asking who needs what I uniquely have to offer. Mm. And that's going to also help you to discern there are places you should be and there's places you shouldn't be, um, you know, because your wiring is, is you're not the right person, but there are people who need exactly what you have to offer. So you're talking about the expression of who you are, perhaps is your vocation. And that could be different and it could change through time. Uh, but instead of, instead of maybe taking the shortcut route that I hear from a lot of folks, which is like, ah, oh, this job doesn't, I don't like my job. Uh, when in fact, you know, you might like it, you might, it might be a perfectly good job, but the way you're showing up to it isn't work would, that wouldn't work for anybody. So what you're, what you're advocating is let's build this foundation that you are a child of God. Then that, then that has certain, um, uh, certain repercussions. You have to deal with that in some way, yeah. consequences perhaps. Uh, and then you might find a great fit in your current vocation, but you might be, have to approach it differently. You might see it differently, or you might find this current vocation is really not a good fit. It is a mismatch for who I'm created to be. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. Um, so P Peter Drucker, a uh, business guru, he, he said that most people think they know what they're good at and most people are wrong, uh, but we only can lead out of strength. So, so part of it is, yeah, uh, am I defining who I am by this job? Well, he, you might be greatly disappointed um, or your marriage or whatever callings in life. Um, it also could be just a matter of, I don't know what I bring to this. I don't know what I'm good at. Uh, and, and it's when you help people tap in. Uh, there's a great book by Tom Rath, uh, Strengths-Based Leadership, uh, that really kind of the secret sauce of leadership and making an impact is authentic leadership. It's knowing your strengths, your talents. And then how to leverage that to make a greater impact. And when you can do that, okay, here's who I am in Christ. Here's how I've been gifted. Now, how do I begin to uh, bless others? Uh, that's where you can start making a greater impact. And, and then, as you said, it's either um, you, you're, you lean into it and you find, yeah, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. I just didn't see it and I didn't realize I was gifted for it. Or it could be a matter of kind of some disciplined de detachment that needs to happen that I need to step away from this. I need to say no and begin to kind of go through a process of cocooning and retooling and reorienting to prepare for a new dream, perhaps, that God may have in mind for my life. And mm -hmm. it sounds like you're building on tools that exist and perhaps you know, self-analysis tools, things like StrengthsFinder, where you can, where through a series of questions, you begin to understand perhaps yourself better. How, how do I show up and why do I show up in that way? And... And then you're also building it, uh, what I'm hearing is you're building it with this idea of uh, the underpinning is your relationship with Christ, yeah. which then drives all of these things. And it, and it finds that underpinning finds its perhaps amplification through who, who you are, your makeup uh, by nature or nurture. And then how do you go up to express yourself in the world? Now, I, the, there are other frameworks that do this. Uh, the one that comes to my mind is the Japanese uh, Ikigai. I, if I'm, I might be pronouncing that incorrectly, right? But that, uh, that talks about these aspects of what you love, what the world needs, what you're good at, yeah. and what you can get paid for, and sort of looking holistically and then so, is, at all the options and then zeroing down on the, the thing that you could probably have, you know, make a good go of uh, for work. C compare and contrast, perhaps, why why the call to be framework and what you're advocating for, and how that differs or is similar to other frameworks. Yeah, so we use um, I, I know what you're talking about. So we use a basic uh, calling model, and so it's kind of instead of like that four circles, it's three. Uh, so it's um, uh, what am I? You know, basically, what have I been gifted to do? Mm. What has God laid on my heart? What am I passionate about? And that's either you have a great joy or it's a great burden. Mm -hmm. uh, this then discerns what that is. And then it's that third circle, um, who needs what I have to offer? Again, not what the world needs, who needs what I have to offer. And it's in that sweet spot uh, that you find where you can make the greatest impact. And the more that you can bring alignment to that, 
the greater that impact, the greater that influence grows. Where that one model I know you're talking about, uh, I've seen it, I, I don't get into as much because they typically tend to call your work, what you get paid to do is your vocation. Right. To me, vocation is the word calling uh, in Latin. And calling is not just what you do for a job. Calling, for Luther at least, his perspective, it was all of life. It's the home. It's your church. It's your workplace. It's in being a good neighbor in society and a global citizen in our world today. And now it's living that inside out, who I am in Christ, defined identity that's, that's rock solid, that gifting of, uh, and what I talk about is you're discovering your divine GPS. So your gifts, passions, and strengths. And similar to my GPS device in my car that helps me navigate the roads, we have an internal GPS of God's workmanship, gifting, and design in our lives that help us then to begin to navigate life. I'm not going to tell you exactly where to go, but you're always going to be oriented with your true north, your identity in Christ. And then it's kind of like this uh, 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 gyroscope system that keeps you balanced, keeps you oriented, and knowing what you have to offer to others. So I've got a... Uh, um. In, in a lot of our discussions that we've had with authors, uh, we talk about the thing, I, I say it this way, and I'd love your feedback on this and how this works is with called to be, uh, there's, there's always a similarity, some, some sort of commonality in all of your highest highs, your lowest lows, that if you kind of pull on that one thread, that's the thread that holds the whole sweater together. Hmm. That's, it's something that's consistent in your character, in your spirit, uh, and and perhaps, perhaps that's kind of what you're talking about with this idea of purpose that, that, uh, you know, I've, uh, person I know has this naturally just loving, caring spirit, right? In all things, sometimes it gets wildly out of hand and, you know, this, this individual will, will take care of things that are, you know, not theirs to be taken care of. Uh, but in, in its best, it's just like, man, that is just full on loving people. And I look at myself and I'm like, well, I don't have the, I don't have the energy for that. There's yeah. nothing in me that's like, great. I just like fill up on all the people. It, I don't have that in me. I have something similar in a diff, but it's, it, it, it gives the same thing in a diff or in a different expression. Yeah. It, but when I look at the, the commonality, I see that character quality in, in my past. And it seems to me that's kind of what you're talking about, that there's something that is your gifting imparted to you that you can amplify or let it go dormant, perhaps. Yep. Uh, and when you are amplifying that, you talk about having joy in what you're doing and perhaps, what did, I can't remember what the, the word used for the opposite of that, um, but the thing that you're not finding joy in Many times people are focusing on that because maybe they've got their foundation wrong, uh, which is, I guess, the, uh, you know, the idea of a, a person goes off, makes all the money and, you know, gets to the, the end of their career and they're like, yeah, but I don't have any relationships and nobody cared that I made all this money. And it turns out I don't care either. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I, a couple, couple of things there. Uh, one is, I think it's, it's the orientation is life about serving me. Mm. Make, Self happy. For Luther, life was about love and service to others. That's everything when, that he talked about ultimately boiled down to love and service for neighbor. Um, now, we only can really effectively do that if we know who we are in Christ and how we've been gifted. That's where we're going to make a greater impact. But then it's, it's also, too, it's doing it in a way that's aligned to who you are. Uh, we, we talk in Clifton Strengths about your strength zone and your stress zone. Um, your strength zone is where, you know, everything that you're, excuse me, sorry, I get, I get very animated here. Uh, mm -hmm. Everything that you're doing is, is in line and, and really as its foundation is, is, are your God-given talents and your strengths. Uh, there you're going to have energy. You're going to probably have more success, more joy, but then there's your, your stress zone. Those are where you're doing things in life, but it's not undergirded by your natural God-given talents. Uh, or your wiring, your design, and there it's going to be depleting. It's going to take more time, more energy. Eventually, that's where you start having, uh, you know, uh, 
you know, sometimes high blood pressure and burnout and you want to quit your job and, and, you know, run away to the woods or something. And, and I think that that's when we live out there and it's not undergirded by who we are. Um, that's a very dangerous place to be. Hmm. I was thinking just as an example of this was that, um, when I was, uh, grade school, six, seven, eight years old, my parents had, uh, this is the, in the days of long playing records, right? And they had, um, up comedy routines mm. on record and I would listen to them and I memorized them. I didn't have a single other friend. I knew nobody my age who could do that, Yeah, who wanted to do it, who found it interesting, who yeah. thought it was a way a worthwhile exercise, but I did. I just, I gravitated towards it. I wanted to put, I wanted to push, well, you didn't push play, you put the needle on, right? I wanted to drop the needle on that record time and time and time again until I rem remembered every word of it. Why? Well, as I've thought about it over the years, and I've looked at what I've ended up doing, the things that people have asked me to do, the things that I still get asked to do to, through to this day. Hmm. It all centers around this mythic calling of a communicator, transmitter, uh, the, the, the mouthpiece as it were between the sender and the receiver. Yeah. And the reason stand up comedy was so appealing to me in a way was because you could deliver lines in the English language in a certain way, and you could immediately see the reaction. Yeah. You could hear it, right? People began to laugh and chuckle and all that. And, um, that was what appealed that just sort of captivated me in a way that, um, none of my friends, I played the records for them. They're like, ha ha ha, you know, move on, let's go play, right, let's right, go right. play outside. And, but for me, it was like, no, this is, this is magic, man. You gotta, you gotta get into this. And they didn't understand. And I think that's, that's, that's sort of a, the, the best example I can think of is the one that I, I truly lived through. Yep. Um, and that has been with me since I was, you know, since I was this tall. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think it's just, uh, you know, I know parents struggle with this, you know, they, they have their hopes and dreams for their kids and, and they're always trying to pour in and get them to be that and kind of live vicariously through them rather than I think a much healthier approach. And I know we took this with our son is how's God gifted him? What's his natural inclinations and interests? And then how do we nurture it? How do we pull that out as mm -hmm. a poop pouring in? And, and, you know, the one who poured in was God. So let's help pull that out instead yeah. of trying to pour our hopes and dreams in for our children. Well, Paul, the one, one of the things that I reminded of as you're telling your story is the time when I uh, asked my dad uh, for Christmas one year, because he asked me, hey, what do you want? I asked him for a stapler. And I probably was about eight. And because I had this thing about office supply stores, I just loved walking up and down office supply stores. And he gave, he graciously gave me a stapler and it is a great stapler. I don't know what that, I don't know what that thread, <laughs> what thread that thing belongs to, but I still love me a good office supply store. Now, <laughs> the, the audience for this book, mm -hmm. I'm just running through my mind all these various audiences, right? There's the little kid of me, you know, asking for staplers, reading books on artificial intelligence. And, you know, I want to be a programmer. Uh, and then there's, you know, my kids who, you know, go through high school and whatever, and they're supposed to figure out what they're supposed to do with their lives. Right. And then you get the churches, uh, and the messages out there to just the general public of, you know, God's created you for a purpose. And if you're feeling unsettled, it's because you're not living on purpose. And then you know, those of us in our forties and fifties, uh, you know, we're like, turns out nobody's got it figured out yet. And we're all just kind of, you know, looking to what we're going to be when we grow up. Who's the audience for this book? Who should pick up this book and just really dig in? What are the characteristics of that person's life that they'll get the most value out of this? Yeah. At a, at a high level, we say, uh, everyday believers. That's that's our term for the priest of all believers. Um, because for me, I, I think that a lot of our members of our churches don't realize they too have a holy calling. Mm -hmm. Not just their pastor, it's just not their professional church worker. 
you have a holy calling, whether it's working at Staples, whether it's uh, being a stand-up comedian, whether it's whatever you're doing in life, when you're using your gifts, living out your calling in Christ in love and service to others, um, that that's your calling and it's holy. Uh, so so that's a big one. But But when we really bring it down, to me, I would say anybody who is going through a time of transition in life, when you're you're moving from one chapter to another chapter, there's a gap there. And you know, you ask the big questions of life in those gaps. Who am I? Why am I here? What per what's my purpose and what difference am I supposed to make? And it's in those moments that I think my book called to be uh, the tools, the resources that we provide, the vision for it, uh, the coaching that we can provide, uh, I think really can help people to bridge that gap from what was to what God's calling you to be. Hmm. Very good. I um, I want to circle back just on one thing, Travis, because I know this is a big part of what you talk about in the book. And I'm, I'm having little flashbacks, but the details aren't becoming crystal for me. So the divine GPS. Yes. Your gifts, your passions, and your strengths. How does this work? What, what people discover, what these gifts are, they discover what the passions are, they discover what the strengths are. And what's the difference between a gift and a strength? Yeah. And then yeah. when you put those three together, what, what's an example, what does it look like when somebody's operating in those? Yeah. Yeah. So, so gifts, we tend to talk about the gift of our personality and within that there is a uh, temperament, what's, what's hardwired inside of us, like mm-hmm. the computer mainframe. And then there's character. And that's the soft wire, the programmable part of our personality. Uh, so we have some different assessment tools, the DISC assessment to help understand your temperament. And we have the VIA values and action assessment to help understand your character and your values in life. Uh, the, the second are your passions. So we've got a passion assessment. Again, what's, what do you get really excited about? Or what's the deep burden that God has placed on your heart? And they tend to be people, passions, interest, passions. Uh, Those kind of things that we help you identify. Uh, And then finally, your strengths. That's your God-given talents. We utilize the Clifton Strengths Assessment. So it's in the mix of those. And and they're not there to to utterly define you. This is who you are. We always talk about in coaching that assessment tools are to help deepen awareness. Mm -hmm. To help you in a different way, just understand in a better way, hey, this is how God has created you. This is how he's wired you. Um, and now let's take a look at that and now start thinking about what's it look like to live that out. Uh, and, and it's not like a, 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 you know, kind of a A to B directly. It's sometimes sure. it's trial and error. Sometimes it's walking along in a journey. You try something and eventually realize, nope, it's not that. It's this. But it's really just kind of looking around and saying, hey, what's it look like to live authentically? Uh, mm. God's wired me to be, and and again, not in a self-focused way, but in love and service to others. I always love this definition of calling. It's as far as your eyes can see, and as far as your hands can reach, that's who you've been called to love and serve today. Yeah. yeah. And so I think it's just saying, hey, this is who I am. Let's help you get some awareness. Now let's walk with you to think about, to live that out with greater impact and intentionality. Yeah. Sounds... Uh, it sounds an awful lot like the Old Testament verse, the, you know, whatever, whatever you find your hands to do, do it as though you're working for the Lord. Yep. And, yeah. and with that framework, that could, that could change everything about that, that tough moment in a person's, in a person's life and in their vocation. Doesn't mean you need to cut bait on it, but might mean that you need to reassess why you're doing it and how you're doing it. Yeah. Mm, interesting. I like that. I was uh, thinking of um, when we when we quote from Deuteronomy and we say that uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And when I first read it as a very immature believer, I'm like, okay, his strength means the physical body. Well, it can. But then I looked into the, the actual language that it was written in, and it was this word moed. And moed means uh, wherever you have abundance. Hmm. right wherever you're strongest then you the way you integrate and become one the same way he is one the lord our god the lord is one 
and you shall love the Lord your God, and you shall be one, because you use that strength and abundance that flows out of you yeah. to do what? To love him and serve him by loving and serving his other children. Oh, yeah. okay. Problem <laughs> solved, right? Now it all stacks together and makes sense. And I love, uh, I love that you're, you're, you're challenging people to find a way to do that irrespective of what the world thinks or on any given day trends, you know, so this is really important. Eh, maybe, maybe not. Maybe, uh, maybe that's no affair of yours, even though you, it looks like it is, Yeah. but because you know what your divine GPS says. Yeah. I mean, I get to do that. It's the, well, it's the most freeing thing in the world. Now I get to do that all the time. So, hey, what about this? No, no, it's got nothing to do with me. Yep. Think back. It's it. Yeah. It, it's freeing when you know who you are mm -hmm. and it allows you to say yes to the things you're supposed to say yes to. And it gives you freedom to say no to things that you're not as good at. Uh, I know what I'm not good at. And, um, you know, now what's wonderful is when you can partner with others who make up for what's lacking in you. My wife is a perfect example. What my, what, on our Clifton strengths, my top or her bottom and vice versa, God has a way of bringing those people in our life, whether through friends, coworkers, and especially with spouses. And yet the thing is, is we're better together than we are by ourselves. Oh, yeah. We can make a greater impact. And that's where I love it. It's the idea of power of two. It's not addition, especially when God's involved. It's multiplication. He multiplies our talents. He multiplies our impact when we're in partnership with people who have complementary talents and gifts to ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Travis, this has been great. Um, where should we send people if they would like to pick up a copy of Called to Be and learn a little bit more about what's the best place online for us to, to send them? Yeah. So probably the, the two best places would either be to my website, uh, Called to Be, and that's called the number two and the letter B.com. Um, and you probably will get the best price there um, or go to Wiffenstock. Uh, so that's another place. And the reason I would suggest those two as opposed to Amazon, you could go to Amazon and get the book. But um, we found that uh, sometimes in the world of publishing, they don't always align the covers exactly the way that they're designed by the, uh, the main publisher. Uh, so uh, the highest quality book, uh, you could get it uh, either called to be or at uh, Wiffenstock. Uh, if you want to get it at Amazon, it's there as well. Uh, Barnes and Nobles, all the different uh, book distributors. Fantastic. Well, this has been a great episode of the Emissary Authors Podcast. We've been chatting with Travis Goose, Goosey, Dr. Travis Goosey, Goosey yep. author of Called to Be. Travis, it's been great to see you again, my friend. We'd love to have you back again sometime soon. And in the meantime, my co-host is Jason Todd. I'm Paul Edwards. This is the Emissary Authors Podcast, where we help faith-driven founders tell the stories that matter. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.